Well, welcome to the session on Thomas More and the Art of Publishing One. Uh, my name is Brian Cummings and I'll be chairing the session. I'd like to begin by thanking the organisers, uh, the amateur Tom Amori and, uh, of course, Marie-Claire Philippot, especially. Um, and uh, we have three papers. What I suggest we do is that we have all three papers and then have a discussion afterwards collectively. Uh, so um, I'll introduce each, each speaker before before their talk. So first of all we have Gabriela Schmidt uh, who studied classics and English at Universities of Munich and of Oxford um, and was then research fellow on the interdisciplinary project uh, Pluralization and Authority in the early modern period and in Munich which many people here may have known which is an absolutely fantastic uh, period of intellectual life there. And she joined the English department at Munich in, in, as a senior lecturer in 2009. Her main interests are in Renaissance humanism, Renaissance, uh, Reformation literature, and also in uh, translation, in, in the widest sense. And she's the author of uh, Thomas More und die Sprach Sprachenfrage, Humanistische Sprachtheorie und die Translationsstudie in England, der frühen Tudorzeit, which is uh, Heidelberg 2009. She also serves on the editorial board of Moriano. So her paper is entitled Of Travellers, Messengers and Foundlings, Thomas More's fictionalising use of paradigms. Thank you very much, Brian. Thomas More knew what he wanted from his publishers. This becomes very clear in a letter he sent to Erasmus barely three weeks after he had commissioned the publication of his first major work in print. Some time ago, I sent you my nowhere. I'm most anxious to have it published soon, and also that it be handsomely set off with the highest of recommendations, if possible from several people, both intellectuals and distinguished statesmen. The brief passage reveals Moore's keen awareness of both the material qualities and the promotional potential of his chosen medium. In particular, Moore insists on the tactical use of those printed features, visual and textual, that are now familiar to us under the label paratexts, and which, according to its inventor, Gerard Genet, enable a text to become a book and to be offered as such to its readers. In this paper, I would like to present more as a virtuoso player of this particular publishing instrument, one who knew how to turn its manipulative potential to his own advantage, whether at court, within international humanist circles, or in post-Reformation theological disputes. At the same time, Moore's paratexts can repeatedly be seen as playfully frustrating conventional reader expectations and thus testing the limits of the very distinction between text and paratext, particularly in the literary dialogues. In doing so, they raise important questions about early modern notions of fictionality, authorship and intellectual property. Before I address these transgressive features, let me first briefly comment on an example that strikingly demonstrates Moore's dexterity in exploiting conventional paratextual techniques. I mean his decision to reprint in 1518 a commendatory poem that he had first contributed to a 1517 verse collection by his French-speaking rival at the Tudor court, Bernard André. A 16-liner by Thomas Moore on the hymns of the royal poet Bernard André from Toulouse. As David Carlson has pointed out, the different publishing context in Moore's epigrammata gives the ambiguously worded text a completely different meaning. Under the new title, and I'm using the Yale editor's translation here, on a certain author who in unlearned style wrote hymns in honor of the saints, explaining in his preface that he wrote them in an offhand way without observing the rules of meter and that his subject matter required no eloquence, what was previously encoded as praise for elegant brevity becomes criticism of sloppiness. What was meant to be read as creative liberty becomes a lack of metrical skill. And what was meant to be real aesthetic pleasure on the part of the reader becomes mischievous laughter at the expense of the poet. This act of formal translation, as Carlson calls it, draws our attention to the extent to which Moore was aware of the way in which paratexts through their transformative potential, permeate and determine the entire meaning of their respective texts. Rather than just being liminal thresholds, as Jeanette would have it, early modern paratexts, according to Alan Smith and Louise Wilson, work both outwards 
altering the context and possibilities of the text's reception and inwards, transforming not only the appearance but the priorities and tone of the text. They function thus as pervasive organizers of communication. On the surface, of course, the title of Moore's epigram figures as a rather conventional instance of Jeanette's paratext. It's typographically clearly set apart from the text itself, and it poses as the introductory remark of an author whose name and credentials figure prominently on the title page. Nevertheless, the very fact that we ultimately do not know who is responsible for the insertion of the title, Froben, the printer, one of his assistants, Moore himself, or Erasmus, the editor, makes the statement it contains essentially plurivoiced. This leads me to a second aspect of Jeanette's theory that has repeatedly been marked as problematic when dealing with early modern publishing contexts, the alleged dependence of paratext on authorial intention. The plurality of authorities involved in the production of Moore's epigrammata as a textual object throws into high relief the constructed nature of any mod early modern claim to authorship. In other words, the paratext, rather than emanating from the consciousness of an author, becomes itself the origin of authorship, or as Peter Stalibras succinctly puts it, the author must ultimately be read as a paratext. Hence, and this is again from Smith and Wilson's introduction, both text and paratext operate at the level of representation. Both are in some sense second order, engaged in the construction of a represented world, engaged in fiction making. This transgressive potential of the early modern paratext, its simultaneously authorizing and deauthorizing role becomes especially evident in Thomas More's literary dialogues. In them, I will argue, Moore is not only aware of this potential, he actively engages in it, playfully enhances it, and exploits it to its, maxim to its maximum. Much has already been written about the unusual combination of paratexts that surround Moore's utopia from the very beginning. I will thus limit myself here to recollecting a few crucial points. All readings agree that the elaborate exchange of letters and poems accompanying the book situates the text in what could be called an idealized community of the learned. What, it's also, what is also usually recognized is the contradictory character of these documents as they mix scholarly seriousness with ironic play, fiction markers with assertions of factuality, and real with fictional voices. More recent analyses have called for a heightened attention to the material difference of the first four editions as textual objects and to the very different reading experience each one creates. In what is to my mind one of the most perceptive accounts, Elizabeth McCutcheon lays special emphasis on the abrupt immediacy with which the reader is thrown into the textual universe of the 1516 Editio Princeps. After a relatively plain title page, uh, sorry, after a relatively plain title page which evokes both the conventions of travelers' tales and of philosophical discourse, the reader encounters an anonymous map of the island and an equally anonymous poem accompanied by an alphabet and a Latin translation. The speaker of these enigmatic paratexts is in fact the island itself, or is it perhaps the book that introduces itself as both insular and non-insular, philosophical and non-philosophical, the height of perfection and capable of improvement, a first taste of all the paradoxes that are to follow. There is no mediating voice in these paratexts, no airlock, to put it in Jeanette's terms, that helps the reader pass without too much respiratory difficulty into the fictional world of the text. In fact, there is hardly anything paratextual at all if we take Jeanette's functional category seriously. We are instead confronted with a kind of frameless frame, deliberately leaving us at a loss, or, as Elizabeth McCutcheon has put it, teasing us into thought. Even though the paratexts that follow this page look somewhat more conventional, the mingling of categories continues. After a commendatory poem by a seemingly authoritative yet fictional poet laureate follows the long-expected preface of the editor, Peter Giles, to his friend, Jerome Bus Leiden. If the reader expects some guidance from this as to the location of textual authority and truth, he is, however, mistaken. In fact, Giles' preface appears in many respects like a literary relay race, with authorial responsibility being passed on from one figure to another until it fades literally into nowhere. 
With the weighty authority of Leonard Moore, the author and owner of the text, whose name is spelt in capitals, Giles juxtaposes the competing claim of the original teller of the tale, Raphael Hyslodius, who has the advantage of autopsy, but whose account is nevertheless surpassed by the rhetorical vividness, vividness of Moore's written representation. Giles then advances his own claim to authority, superior to Moore's, in that he was able to add further material, the map and the alphabet, given to him after Moore's departure. Nevertheless, his knowledge is also limited, which is why we are ultimately referred back to his Lydias once more, whose whereabouts are, however, uncertain. A very similar open-ended chain, chain of authorities is established in John Desmarais' letter and finally in Moore's own preface, both addressed to Giles. Since all of these authorial personae mentioned in the paratexts also figure as interlocutors in the dialogue later on, the distinction between text and paratext is in fact virtually erased, and the fictional dialogue about utopia becomes part of a semi-factual conversation among humanist circle of friends, who treats it as common property. It has been argued with some justice that the element of indeterminacy and playfulness has been carried to an extreme in the 1516 Editio Princeps, and that the following 1517 edition reverts instead to a much more conventional paratextual presentation of the text, offering it to the reader as a useful handbook. Sorry. There we go. Whose main body is clearly marked off as a fictional ex exemplum. While there may have been some desire on Moore's part to provide a greater degree of guidance for his readers, I remain skeptical of Jürgen Meyer's thesis that this should be read as deliberate backpedaling on Moore's part to regain authorial control over a project that had obviously slipped out of his hands. As a matter of fact, while fiction markers are indeed more frequent in the 1517 version and the pseudo-historic map and alphabet are missing, the playful relegation of responsibility among a variety of authorial personae continues and is in a sense even enhanced in the 1517 paratexts. It's especially in the ironical afterword that one can almost sense the glee with which Moore teases his unlearned readers who cannot decide whether to trust the historical veracity of his account or not. Like Giles in his letter to Bus Leiden missing in this edition, Moore eventually sends them back to his Lydias himself to inquire the truth from him, or if they like, dig it out of him with questions. The strongest evidence, however, that Moore's role in this play with paratextual constructs of authorship and their fictionalizing potential was an eagerly active rather than a reluctant one is the fact that he continues it in the paratexts of his later writing, not just in the clandestinely written Tower works, for example, the dialogue of comfort or his role play in the letters with Margaret Roper, but also perhaps surprisingly in his Re Reformation polemics, the first of which I will address in the last part of this paper. Moore's responsio ad Lutherum coincides with the first phase of anti-Lutheran reaction in England, immediately after the Diet of Worms and the promulgation of the papal bull Exurge Domine, accompanied by a public book burning at St. Paul's. Henry VIII's personal answer to Luther, the Assertio Septem Sacramentorum, earned him, as we know, the title of a defender of the faith, even though the actual authorship of the text remains a fraud matter. That Moore himself played a part in the composition is rarely doubted, although the real extent of his contribution remains unclear. What we do know is that when Luther replied to the king a year later with a scathing diatribe, Moore, like several other theologians in England and beyond, decided or was asked to compose a polemical answer of his own. The very title page of Moore's Responsio makes it clear that the royal printer, Richard Pinson, wanted to associate it with an official humanist program of royal anti-Lutheran propaganda. It has the same frontispiece as all the legal documents accompanying the publication of Henry's Assertio. While the frontispiece of the Assertio itself imitates that of the 1518 and the 1520 edition of Moore's Epigrammata. What seems all the more surprising, given this authoritative presentation, is the fact that Moore thought it necessary to devise several layers of elaborate fiction in the paratexts to distance himself from authorship. What is more, the fictional production context he devises, 
complete with fictional prefaces, fictional printer's notes, and fictional commendatory poems, differs completely in the two existing editions. In the introductory epistle of the first version, the story begins in a printer shop, where the letter writer, another printer by the name of Carl Celius, has picked up the draft of an anti-Lutheran tract by a Spanish author, Ferdinand Baravelos, a university man. Carcelius thinks the work so good that everyone would be eager to buy it. In order to even increase its reader appeal and market value, he suggests adding chapter headings and an index and does not even exclude more, more far-reaching changes to the text. Thus, even at this end of the production process, the authorship of the text appears already as a plural one. This pluralization continues in Baravellus' own prefatory letter. He claims that he has been artfully tricked into writing the work by the uncle of the addressee, a member of the Spanish nobility, who even dictated the exact method of the, of the text, extensive commented quotation of both the king's work and Luther's answer. As if this would not have been enough of a denial, Baravellus finally bequeaths the book and any profit it might make to the nephew, one Ferdinand Lucellus, since his uncle, whose name we never learn, has in the meantime passed away childless. We're instinctively reminded of the open-ended quest for a guarantor of truth in Utopia, where his Lydias is repeatedly presented as the last possible resort that is unfortunately out of reach. Responsibility for the work is distributed among a variety of figures, a deceased anonymous Spanish nobleman, his nephew and heir, Baravellas, who fashions himself as a mere ghostwriter, and finally the two printers involved in the production. Even the text itself is introduced as a conglomerate, as a conglomerate of many voices, Luther's, the King's, Baravellas's, as well as the printers in headlines and annotations. The inner polyphony is almost tangible in the complex layout of the book, which uses different fonts, quotation marks, and marginalia, thus pushing, as David Travers argued, the organizational limits of the printed page and marking the text as essentially dramatic and dialogical. And you can see in the margins that the marginalia function like um, speech markers in a, in a play almost. We have the words of the king, we have Luther's ver words, we have quotations from other authors, biblical quotations, and so forth. Nevertheless, the Baravellas version had to be withdrawn before it even left the printing house, since the controversy had in the meantime moved on, which required the inclusion of further material. Interestingly, Moore uses the opportunity to multiply his authorial masks even further. The Spanish setting is abandoned, and the text is now claimed to have been written by an English expatriate at Rome called Guillemus Rossius. Having been driven from the city by the plague, 1522 was indeed a plague year in Rome. Ross is persuaded to engage in the project by the Anglophil Anglophile host in his country retreat. After he complies, the, the host and several learned friends to whom he shows the text persuade the reluctant Rose to have it published, whereupon Rose decides to entrust the book to a young Bohemian student on his way to England. In a further twist, the messenger is, however, mysteriously lost, and what appears instead is an unauthorized pirated edition under another name. Ross thus concludes by begging his friend Carl Celius, whose name is retained, to restore again to him his offspring, which by some fortune or other was shipwrecked on some unknown shore. Carl Celius duly promises this after having assured a favorable reception by the learned and by the king himself. Several common features with Utopia are apparent from this description. First, there is Moore's palpable desire to place the text within an imagined community of the learned, in this case an English as well as a pan-European one. This fits in, in fact the collaborative and internationally oriented character of the first phase of anti-Lutheran propaganda in England, just as it concurs with the international character of the English humanist book trade. Hence, it adds to the probability of the fictional scenario. Even more importantly, as James Simpson and others have argued, Moore's collaborative authorial stance established in the paratexts anticipates a deeper theological concern that is central to the entire work, 
his attack on Luther's literalism and the appeal to a communal, unwritten interpretive tradition that transcends the limits of individual reading and authorship. This directly leads us to another similarity with Utopia, the playful deconstruction of textual authority, which is handed down from persona to persona, none of them ultimately willing to assume it. When reading these elaborate paratexts, one cannot but think that Moore must have immensely enjoyed deceiving his readers by adding one fictional twist after another. Just as six years earlier he enjoyed mocking their naivety in his critical postscript to Peter Giles. What is, however, new in the Responsio is not only its, enha its enhanced realism, especially in the Rossius version, but its prominent concern with print as a medium and the questions of ownership and reliability that it raises. It is an issue that will become even more salient in the 1529 dialogue concerning heresies, in whose fictional situation text and paratexts finally merge into one another. Like Chancellor Moore's concern about misrepresentation and possible piracy in the preface of the dialogue, Rossius' anxiety to have his progeny restored to him reveals a profound distrust in the distortional possibilities of print, which depersonalizes knowledge and spreads it as a mere commodity, as Thomas Betteridge has remarked. At the same time, the very argumentative method of the, respons of the responsio seems to rely on a fundamental trust in the printed page's ability to restore the real text as opposed to Luther's alleged misrepresentation of Henry's words and help the reader arrive at the truth. A similar ambivalence seems to have attended the effect of Moore's use of paratextual fictions. While on the one hand designed to disguise Moore's authorship and enable him to, his, to hide his authority behind a variety of masks, on the other hand, they precisely served as an indicator to reveal it, apparently turning the elaborate play with authorial fictions into a kind of Morean trademark. Thus, while everything in Johann Eck's copy of the Responsio at Munich University Library points to the fact that he was taken in by the pirated first edition story, where Rossius mentions the plagiarist, he writes suppostor in the margin, meaning, that somebo meaning somebody who fraudulently exchanges a child. The pseudonym Rossius seems, however, to have been an open secret to him. He underlines the author's name on the title page and glosses it on the margin as Tome More. Sorry, it's the wrong, <laughs> the wrong uh, transparency. Thus showing us that in the never-ending process of reading, one paratext may well come to perform the unmasking of another. Thank you very much. <laughs>